Mr. Zog and Ms. Williamson. Uh, the topic of this debate is that it was wrong for Q&A to include Zaki Mella in the audience. The, the affirmative team seated to my right is from Pembroke School, and the negative team seated to my left is from St. Aloysius College. The speaking time for this debate is six minutes. A single warning bell will sound one minute before the speaking time, and a double bell will sound at the speaking time. Please ensure that your mobile phones are switched off or put on time. I declare this debate open and call upon the first hearing speaker, Nate Miranda. Good evening, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for tonight's debate is that it was wrong for Q&A to include Zaki Mala in the audience. We determined this to mean Q&A's actions were wrong in that Q&A were both irresponsible and also damaging to Mallard's cause, which we, the affirmative team, consider to be worthy of serious consideration. Simply put, Mallard's cause is to have a discussion about the powers of Australian government as over citizenship. As the affirmative team, we want to cl clarify the parameters of the debate. Q&A is an ABC program that fosters discussion for a variety of topics using a panel of political leaders and other persons of interest. Zaki Mala was a questioner in the audience of the June 22nd episode of Q&A this year. These are uncontested matters. However, before I continue to my substantive case, tonight I would like to explain that this is not a debate about freedom of speech. It is a debate about Q&A's management, or more accurately, mismanagement of an important issue, and Q&A's poor selection of Mala to represent his view. The affirmative team is not saying that in Australia there is no freedom of speech and expression, yet this is clearly distinguished from a right to be on national television. Tonight I will address two major points. Firstly, I will explain to you how Q&A allowed Mallard onto the show without a full knowledge of his history, even though it was their job to know. Secondly, I will show you how Q&A's choice of Zaki Mala as a representative of his view was poor and led to damaging consequences. Our second speaker, Millie, will tell you about how Q&A itself was a worryingly uncontrollable forum in which to have attempted to hold this discussion. She will go on to explain what Q&A was an infotainment show and had to gain from the situation it created and why this helps explain the events on the June 22nd episode. <coughs> our third speaker will rebut and sum up our team case. First, it was Q&A's job to know about Zaki Mala's history and to act accordingly. It is routine for Q&A to make background checks on proposed panellists and of audience members who will be asking questions to the panel. An audience member's question will also be required in written form prior to the show for review. Mala was no exception to this progress. Important, important aspects of Mala's history, already well known to the ABC, include his charges of terrorism in 2003. During the period of charges were ongoing, he was held in prison for two years. He was later found not guilty of charges of terrorism. However, in 2005, Mala pleaded guilty to his charges of making death threats to ASIO officers. He received a prison sentence which was already served due to his two-year detainment while awaiting a sentence for his terrorism charges. However, Q&A failed to uncover that in January of this year, Mallard posted violent, misogynistic comments on his Twitter. He branded two prominent female journalists whores, who he said both needed to be gangbanged on the Sunrise desk. These more recent <coughs> threats are made more serious in light of his previous threats and provide a strong basis for denying Mala a platform on the show. Although the ABC says that if they had known, Mala would, uh, would not have been allowed in Q&A. It was the ABC's job to know. So, what we see is that Q&A was culpably negligent in its research on Mala, and, it, and this irresponsibility was the source of the damage that occurred subsequent to Q&A's decision to include Mala on the show. Now to my second point that Zaki Mala's persona and profile make him a poor representative of his point of view. While there were many alternative people to represent an identical or similar perspective, Mala has a volatile and sometimes confrontational personality, which is a personal characteristic irre irrelevant to his actual point of view. This made him a poor choice as an advocate on this important and sensitive issue. I have already mentioned his misogynistic comments and further, 
when Mallard was facing frustration while being held in prison. He then purchased a rifle and ammunition, prepared his will and made a video to be played after he died. Mallard bragged about this. In addition to this, in September of 2005, Mallard was found guilty, assaulting a prison officer during his detainment. And this is yet another example of his poor character. So there were many more suitable people for Q&A who could have requested to represent the same or a similar point of view on the issue. For example, Annie Ali, who appeared on the following episode, who was greatly educated about radicalisation and counter-terrorism, who could have been an effective person to raise the discussion herself. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many others who have strong profiles in the area who Q&A could have contracted to express the same view. Nevertheless, Q&A did choose the poor representative Zaki Mala with negative consequences. What occurred greatly distracted the public discussion about the government's power over citizenship. The media subsequently twisted Mala's words and misconstrued his intended message, which is, which is that he feels the government currently has too much power over citizenship. On the 22nd of June, 2% of Australians saw Zaki live on Q&A, but the other 98% saw him over their wheat bix the next morning at <coughs> night, 7 sunrise, or 9 today. Unlike Q&A, these media outlets made no attempt to focus on Mallard's actual message. Instead, they misinterpreted his words to make out the public that Mallard advocates for Muslims to emigrate to Syria and join ISIS. This is a completely incorrect interpretation for what Mallard was actually saying. Q&A's choice of Zaki Mallard was wrong because due to his personality and history, his damage, uh, it was damaging outcome was certainly foreseeable. So ladies and gentlemen, it was wrong for Q&A to include Zaki Mallard in the audience, not only because of his disgusting comments he made that were missed by the Q&A team, but also because of his personality, which allowed him to be readily angered and consequently misinterpreted causing great detriment to an important cause. Thank you. I now call upon the first negative speaker, Caitlin Davies. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Chairman. The topic for tonight's debate is that it was wrong for Q&A to include Zaki Millar in the audience. We, the negative team, have made our objective tonight to convince you that this is completely wrong and that Mala should have been allowed in the audience. We, the negative team, agree with the definition given by the affirmative team, but we would like to remind the opposition that Mala is an Australian citizen. The negative team and I collectively define tonight's debate as that it was wrong for Q&A, a discussion show designed to provide a wider Australian audience with different perspectives, to include Zaki Mala, an Australian citizen, 
in the live studio audience for the discussion of Terror, Poverty and Native Titles on Monday 22nd of June this year. Now, I would like to clear up some points made by the affirmative team. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the affirmative team has spoken to you about how my last tweet were misogynistic, which is why he should not have been allowed on Q&A. But we, the negative team, define misogynistic as, according to the Oxford Dictionary, a person who dislikes, despises, or is strongly prejudiced against women. My last tweet may have been socially unacceptable in today's society, but to call it misogynistic is incorrect. Millard, Millard did not imply that he dislikes or even despises these, women, these two news reporters, and he definitely did not show any prejudice, prejudice, prejudice against these women. Therefore, the tweets made by Millard was not misogynistic according to the Oxford Dictionary. Tonight, I will be speaking to you about how Malar, under two legislative acts, had the right to be a part of the audience by asking his specific question. And then lastly, I will speak about how Malar being on Q&A, asking a question and sparking a discussion, was a complete wake-up call to the Australian government that they need to look at the other perspectives before the situation worsens. My first point for tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is that Zaki Malar had every right to be in the live studio audience on the <coughs> ABC program Q&A in terms of the Australian Constitution and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Under the Australian democratic political system, every individual has the right of freedom of speech. Article 19 of the Australian Constitution states that Everyone shall have the right to hold opinions without interference. And now Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinion without interference. Therefore, meaning that Zaki Malak, under the Australian Constitution, had every right to be included in the audience asking his approved question, and, the, and participating in the discussion that followed after. If we said that Zaki Malak should not have been allowed in the Q&A audience, how is that any different and any more fair to four years earlier when, they had, when Julian Assange asked a question which related to the topic of the night? Both Julian Assange and Zaki Malak are Australian citizens and, had, and have every right to voice their opinion on a show that has been created to allow a diverse range of people from all experiences to seek answers from a selected panel deemed relevant to the episode's topic. Zaki Malak had every right to be in the audience and participating with asking a question. My final point tonight is that Zaki Malak's comment on q <coughs> actually provided value by creating a wake-up call to the Australian people and our government which is why Malar on the show was not only right, but beneficial, but beneficial to its own live audience. As a democratic country, Australians are open to listen to the opinions facing any issue of the people. Although, it seems, when the issue of terrorism arises, we are so inclined to believe that one opinion is all that is needed. But, when it comes to a situation as big as terrorism in our society, it should be a necessity to hear the other side and what the real issue surrounding terrorism actually is. For Australians to be able to prevent terrorism in our country, we need to listen to what the root cause of the issue is. By Zaki Malar being in the audience and giving his relevant opinion, it is opening not only the, to, opening not only the, Australia's, the people of Australia's eyes, but also the Australian government to the fact that more than one one-sided opinion is going to be needed to make imp to improve terrorism. By the Australian government not giving a voice to the people with first-hand experience, they are ignoring a legitimate part of the issue. Dr. Anne Ali, counter-terrorism expert, says that what Malal was saying is that the government's approach is likely to be to cause more radicalization. The government's approach isn't helping. I'd like to ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. 
How would you feel if someone closest to you was walking to work and was shot by a terrorist because the govern government made the wrong call on how to deal with terrorism because they didn't get the real perspective? This beneficial opinion made by, made by Malar he, while he was in the audience of Q&A is a clear and obvious wake-up call to the Australian government that if we, don't, if we want to solve and eradicate terrorism, they need to look at both sides of the situation. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, we, the negative team, can believe it was right for Zaki Malar to have been in the live studio audience asking a specific question to relate to the night show because under both the Australian Constitution and the Universal Declaration rights. Malar had every <coughs> right to ask his initial, en initial question and contribute to the discussion which followed. Thank you. I now call upon the second affirmative speaker, Millie Beaton. The first negative speaker has told you that Mala's tweets were not misogynistic. This is simply a ridiculous assertion, as misogyny is not the hatred of individual women, but women in general. Suggesting gang rape in response to two women who were merely doing their job is clearly indicative of a hatred of women in general. Can I ask you, would this have been suggestive of a man if he was doing his job? She also told you that Zaki Mala has a right to express his opinion without interference. While this is true, no one was interfering whatsoever in his right to free speech, merely denying him a national platform which no one is entitled to by default. A the ABC was completely entitled to choose whoever they want in their question audience, otherwise everyone would be going up and asking a question every night. We simply don't have time for this, and he was definitely not the right person to take up that time slot. Just because he has the right to speak on national television doesn't mean that, is, that it isn't wrong for him to represent a certain view and cause more damage than he actually caused help. The, sec the first affirmative speaker, the first negative speaker, also said, that the, speak, uh, that the question posed by Mala caused a lot of value and Australia uh, was caused to have a meaningful conversation about the issue in response to his question. This is completely untrue. While this should have been the case and might have been if anyone else had asked the question, Mala <coughs> is an inflammatory personality who has previous history that made people misinterpret his opinion and purposefully misconstrue it. 
As can be seen by the News Corp head headlines and front pages in various newspapers, one depicting an ISIS, an ISIS person waving a flag with the ABC's logo on it, which is simply ridiculous and is <coughs> always irrelevant to what the man was actually talking about. We actually distracted the public's view away from the discussion at hand. As is a common tactic by governments who are losing favour, as Tony Abbott certainly is, uh, invoking fear in audiences and voters is a common tactic and causes people not to want to change and to discuss important issues. Everyone was terrified and surprised by the inclusion of Zaki Mala, a person formerly convicted on terrorism charges, but then not charged, uh, and thought it outrageous that we should be discussing this. It certainly isn't, but the inclusion of Zaki Mala specifically caused everyone to be outraged and therefore to dismiss the topic at hand. We advocate for this issue to be discussed, but we think that the discussion was put to the side and less important things put on the platform in a response to Mala being included on Q&A. Good evening, Mr Chairman, timekeeper, ladies and gentlemen. I am the second affirmative speaker in tonight's debate. After hearing from our first speaker on why Zaki Mala was a completely inappropriate choice as a representative for the point of view that he expressed, I will now speak to you about why Zaki Mala's appearance was rendered even more damaging by the context in which he appeared, and why it is likely that Q&A predicted and even welcomed the uproar that followed. Q&A is broadcast live to the eastern states of Australia. On the night of Mala's appearance, 560,000 viewers tuned into Q&A, according to Austin figures. More would later go on to watch the episode as it was re-aired and available online. While enough outrage was caused by Mala's statement that the Liberal Party had justified to many Australian Muslims in the community to leave and go to Syria and join ISIL, Tony Abbott going as far to say that heads should roll over the incident. This is by far one of the more innocuous things he could have said. The live audience, as well as the format of the show, in which Mala was free to respond to the panel as in a conversational or informal debate, was an accident waiting to happen. And there was nothing to stop Mala using this incredibly powerful and far-reaching platform to do tactless and indiscriminate damage to his own cause. Perhaps if Mala's question had been posed in a less volatile forum, the disaster that was the media's response to an inevitable misrepresentation of the events could have been averted. It should have been plain to see that Mala's inclusion was going to end badly, and the ABC failed their audience immensely by including him regardless. This brings me on to my second point. Mala had been a member of the audience previously and had even requested and been denied a position as a panel member. As addressed by our first speaker, the ABC was well aware of his time in Syria and his threats against ASIO officials in 2003, which should have prompted thorough investigations and precautions, and clearly did not. Not only this, but to allow his question to be posed specifically to Steve Chiro, an equally inflammatory personality who didn't he hesitate to demonstrate exactly why Mala and others are distrustful of ministers who would decide cases such as his, was at best careless. At worst, it was purposefully provocative, a manoeuvre planned specifically with the intent of improving the show's ratings. Interestingly, an article by The Australian stated that the ratings for the episode after the one on which Mala appeared were the best of the year so far. If the mess created by the ABC was entirely unforeseen, it must be a coincidence that they had so much to gain from it. And this evidence of premeditation shows that the ABC were absolutely capable of averting what would be one of the, its most tasteless episodes for the year. Ladies and gentlemen, the ABC was wrong on many levels to include Zaki Mala on a live show with a significant viewership. And they are lucky their error did not have further reaching consequences if indeed these consequences were unforeseeable. The ABC's management of the events was fraught with complacency and carelessness right up until Tony Jones, the host of Q&A, apologised for said management in his admission that an error was made in having Mr Zaki Mala live in the studio. <coughs> Hopefully, this admission will be a precursor to this, the discussion that should have been had in the first place. Thank you.
Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and Mr. Chairman. Tonight we've been presented with the topic that it was wrong for Q&A to include Zach and Clara in the audience, in which my team and I strongly oppose. We define this topic as that it was not wrong for Q&A, a discussion show which includes different perspectives, to include Zach and Clara, an Australian citizen, in the audience for the discussion on terror, poverty, and native titles on the ABC Q&A show on Monday, the 22nd of June this year. We've already heard Caitlin's points regarding how Malar had every right to speak on the show about his views and how we need to consider both perspectives of the discussion. Now I will speak about how Q&A is not only a show which embraces diversity within their audience, but it's also a show which has two perspectives that need to be heard. I will also be speaking about how there is always a subjective media view in stories like Malar's. But firstly, I'd like to point out some blatant discrepancies made by the other team. Firstly, the affirmative team, the first affirmative speaker, said that the story is not about Malar's freedom of speech. However, as Caitlin expressed in her speech, Malar had every right to express every view that he had on the Q&A show. First affirmative also said that the Q&A were wrong to pick Malar due to his bad character. However, um... However, Malar had gone to jail for two years prior to his involvement on the Q&A show. He'd been to rehab, which is the point of jail, to gain back his goodness and... <laughs> yeah. um, the first family also said that uh, Malar's tweets miso were misogynistic. However, yes, we agree that the tweets were horrible, sexually explicit and wrong. However, we are able to separate the two subjects and say that the reason Malar shouldn't be allowed on the show is not because he wrote some bad tweets about women. Therefore, the Q&A was not wrong to include Malar in the audience based on his tweets. We define misogynistic as the dislike, contempt and ingrained prejudice for a race or gender. Malar so showed no dislike towards the women. We believe he isn't showing any dislike because in some ways he's also showing that the women are attractive. He's showing no contempt because he isn't showing any anger towards the women. And gangbang is typically described in the Oxford Dictionary as having a group of people having sexual intercourse with consent, according to the Oxford Dictionary. And there were no prejudice due to the... Firstly, Q&A were not wrong for including Zaki Malar in the audience because Q&A's sole purpose as show means to encourage any and all people to have a go when asking questions to their panellists and to present a show which has two different opinions on a particular topic. Q&A is a live to air show that happens as viewers watch and is a democracy in action, ladies and gentlemen. And thus, it was appropriate to have a discussion over such a controversial issue on an unbiased show. Zaki Malai was the perfect candidate for this discussion on terror, having had first-hand knowledge where, unlike many commentators, Malai had the experience of having been arrested and detained on terrorism charges, says Dr Ali. This means that the show heard a much-needed side to terrorism and the way that some terrorists might feel in relation to the topic. Not only this, but according to the code of which Q&A abide by, it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from, Everyone can have a go and take it up to our politicians and top opinion makers. Furthermore, ABC's editorial standard quotes <coughs> to prevent a diversity of perspectives so that over time no significant strand of thought or belief within the community is knowingly excluded nor disproportionately represented. By including Milan in the audience, a unique and different perspective on the topic was not excluded from the discussion. So why should Malar be any different from any other person who wishes to ask a question and is well informed due to experience and first-hand knowledge? He, he had first-hand knowledge and he gave the audience valuable insight into his side of the story. Therefore, on the basis that Malar added important scope to the topics based around terrorism and the fact that Q&A encouraged a diverse range of participants within their show, Q&A were not wrong for including Zaki Malar in their audience. Secondly, it was not wrong for the Q&A to include Zaki Malar in their audience based on the criticism which arose in the media following Malar's statement. Malar said, 
The Liberals have now just justified to many Australian Muslims in the community tonight to leave and to go to Syria and join ISIS because of ministers like him. The media presented this comment in a completely subjective view, targeting Malah for a comment that was misjudged entirely. The media cannot always be trusted to deliver a truthful reality, because if they did, they would have relayed the Q&A episode as being a heated discussion, where Malah obviously felt offended by Trogo's statements of, I'm happy to look you straight in the eye and say that I'd be pleased to be part of a government that would say that you were out of the country. Now, if you had the experience of being detained as a suspected terrorist, and you would have meant to be so close to being thrown out of the country. I can be positive that you too would be greatly offended by these statements. It's clear to see that Malala's statement was so misinterpreted by host Tony Jones and politician Graham Morris on the panel, with their initial withdrawn and horrified attitudes when the comment arose, which allowed the media in turn to replicate their attitudes on a larger scale. However, if Tony Jones and Graham had reacted to Malala's comment, by clarifying this question rationally, we'd, aim, we'd be able to see the true intent of Malar's words as he later expressed on the project, saying, anyone who wants to travel and go to Syria or Iraq to join ISIS, don't go. I don't support ISIS and I don't support anyone leaving Australia and their families to join this group. It's clear that the media took Malar's statement and spun it into something which portrayed him incorrectly, creating controversy. Thus, it's clear that Q&A weren't wrong to include Zaki Malad in their audience because due to the media's too often subjective and heavily skewed view, they unfairly attacked Malad in his statement, causing an unfair media outburst against Malad by making assumptions and accusations. He was also unfairly attacked by the media... Oh, so to conclude, due to the fact that Malad had a valuable insight into the terror topic on the night, as well as the fact that Q&A encouraged a diverse range of audience members, Malar was the perfect audience member for Q&A's discussion. He was unfairly attacked by the media in regards to his misinterpreted comment, which the subjective media view heavily affected the way he was portrayed. Thank you. I now call upon the third permanent speaker, Daniel Gage Brown. Good evening, Timekeeper, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. So firstly tonight, I'd like to address the opposition's contention uh, that Zaki Mallard's Twitter comments were misogynistic. So I'd like to put something to you first of all. We don't actually live in the Oxford Dictionary. Um, and so despite the first negative's interpretation of that Oxford Dictionary, dictionary definition of misogynistic, saying, uh, Zaki Mala saying that two women should be sexually abused by multiple men in a public forum shows clear disrespect towards these women and is so clearly misogynistic. And I'd secondly like to move on to explain a really important point of this debate, that it is not a debate about freedom of speech. 
just to begin, we don't actually have official freedom of speech in our country, Australia. We have freedom of political communication. However, in the High Court, there is a general, a general consensus and unspoken law that freedom of speech does exist. However, there are balances against this freedom of speech, such as when you are damaging your own cause by having a poor character on national television that causes media to greatly misinterpret what the affirmative team considers to be an important cause. Uh, so that response addresses what I would say if this was a debate about freedom of speech, but it actually isn't. You actually just don't have a right to be aired on national television. That's a major difference uh, to freedom of speech. Any of you sitting here right now couldn't, uh, in and of itself, by having a view, be enabled to speak on national television about that view. Um, but this is exactly what the first negative put to you tonight. So. Um, what I would like now to move on to is to respond to the first negative assertion, uh, which has come up again multiple times in this debate, that just because Mallard's view is important, that somehow means that it's beneficial. So we, we agree that it's definitely an important view that needs to be discussed, um, but there's a few conditions that it, it doesn't need to be uh, brought across by Zaki Mallard, nor does it need to be uh, done on Q&A. So how, from the Fermi's case tonight, it's evident that um, the beneficial and important aren't the same thing. The, the poor representative, Zaki Mellar, um, essentially by having a confrontational personality, uh, damaged his own cause by easily being misinterpreted by the media following the show. And further, as Millie uh, told you about tonight in her first substantive point, uh, the whole construct of Q&A being a live, uncontrollable system and um, the fact that his question was actually specifically directed at Steve Chiobo in this inflammatory situation shows the design which he was never going to escape from being um, misrepresented. So, uh, she also put to you that this debate is about terrorism, but it's really just not about terrorism. Uh, his original question uh, to, the, to Steve Chiobo, as channeled by Q&A, was uh, would a minister have imprisoned me for what I did um, if he had the decision rather than the courts of law. Um, and then he, his later comments, um, which came in, in a response to Steve Chiovo, were about saying how, um, how this, ministers like him could motivate people to travel to Syria to join ISIL. But this is the exact kind of example that shows how this whole situation that Q&A set up, when they, should, they didn't have knowledge maybe fully completely of how bad Zaki's personality is, but they had a job to know that, um, and th that blew up and was misinterpreted to great damage to uh, his point of view. Um, I'd also like to respond to uh, the sec second negative's um, statement that he served his time. Like, we agree that we live in a society where, um, yeah, he's had a jail sentence, he served it, so he served his time. But we also live in a society that takes into account re-offending, um, and that's treated more seriously and is definitely taken into account. So the basis of that um, re-offending, while not a criminal offence, his misogynistic comments which we've established do show a pattern in his behaviour which is likely to be or potentially going to be a problem on live TV on this contentious issue. She also went on to say that um, the government is taking the complete point of view on this, and we don't contest this. But the affirmative team tonight isn't actually taking the government's point of view, but it does show that the media's uh, misinterpretation and spreading of their idea of what Zaki Mellar said has been so large and damaging that it has caused the government to have a misinterpretation of what actually occurred that night on the show. So ladies and gentlemen, tonight our first speaker, Nate, began the debate by talking to you about how Q&A was irresponsible in being negligent in its research on Zaki Mellar. This caused them to air someone with poor character and poor communication, which resulted in misinterpretation and damage. This led Nate onto a second point in which he talked about how, as a result of Mellar's history, he was clearly a poor representative of an important view, for which there could have been a large number of more eloquent and cool-headed representatives. Yet, as Nate elaborated, Zaki did air on the show, and the resulting damages that really did happen uh, were wide-reaching. So Q&A's wrongly negligent research led to deeply wrong, damaging consequences to an important debate which were foreseeable and could have been easily avoided. 
Tonight, Millie told you firstly about how the forum Q&A itself amplified the poten potential for these damages to occur and their effects after they foreseeably did occur. This was due to the fact that it is a live forum and, there was, and it was uncontrollable and it was broadcast nationally to many people and was constructed in a confrontational manner such that Mala was made to specifically address his question to a minister strongly opposed to Mala as a person. So Millie continued to ex explain how Q&A directly benefited from this confrontational setup and that helped explain how they might have even tried to design it. So ladies and gentlemen, it has, it has become clear over the course of the debate tonight that it was wrong for Q&A to include Zaki Mala in the audience because of their irresponsible research and irresponsible management of the live and broad-reaching forum, which is um, so important to this issue in our society. Good evening, Mr. Chair, fellow debaters, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for tonight's debate is that it was wrong for Q&A to include Zaki Mala in the audience. We as a negative team strongly oppose this statement and have made it our objective tonight to convince you that it is incorrect. I, as a third speaker, will recertify some points made by the affirmative team before summarising our team's case. Yes, we don't live in an Oxford dictionary, ladies and gentlemen. We live in a modern context where the language used in his tweets, although unaccepted, is a part of our everyday vernacular. The term banging, although, again, is unacceptable, has evolved into our vernacular as having consensual casual sex, and it can't be mistaken with rape. Even if we were to take the opposition interpretation of the tweets being violent, their argument is still invalid. <coughs> on the very same night, in, in the very same night, Graham Morris and Stephen Chiover were on the panel. In 2013, they both said on public forums violent comments to PM Julia Gillard, quote, ought to be out there kicking her to death, and quote, opportunity to slit Julia Gillard's throat. Are we saying that it's okay if people of authority make these violent comments and can be included in the program? If Malar's involvement was based upon some violent comments made on Twitter or on any other public forum, the politicians' affirmation should be scrutinised and, and should not have been included in the program. Therefore, the opposition's argument is completely invalid. We would like to remind them that, that Anne Ali and other experts, although are strong spokesmen for the topic of terrorism, do not have the same first-hand experiences of being subject to anti-terrorist policies. Q&A encouraged a diverse audience, and Mallow was a vital perspective needed for the open discussion on terrorism. The opposition have also said it wasn't right to give a person like Zaki Mallow a national platform. To say we should have given her a platform is to say that part of the debate doesn't exist. It's like having tonight's debate with only one team. It's not possible to have a discussion about a controversial topic without different persp perspectives and contradicting opinions. Mallow's views cannot be just shoved on the carpet as they are a legitimate part of the debate about terrorism. We are not saying that what Mallow said was articulated correctly. What we are saying is that it was not wrong to have him in the audience and allow him to voice his perspective. Lockerton have also said that his involvement should not have been allowed because he is re-offending. Ladies and gentlemen, his tweets nor comments 
in any way breach any laws. There are laws about saying and writing things. These are pointed out by our first speaker, but it seems that <coughs> you may have missed it. It is unlawful to incite hatred against others because of their race, their religion, their sexuality, or gender identity under the Defamation Act of 2005 and Anti-Discrimination Act of 1991. My last question, nor comment, nor tweets did any of these things. It is not breaking any laws, therefore, it, he is not committing or recommitting any crime. We would like to remind the opposition that a male appearing on a show that was with a live audience and extensive viewership is exactly what we need. We need to start the discussion. The Australian public constantly hear this one-sided debate and have to have a person like Bella with first-hand experience on the show is what we need to hear the truth. Our first speaker, Caitlin, talked about how Mella had every right to be involved in the discussion because we are a democratic country where every individual has the freedom of speech. It is vital to remember that Mella's comments <coughs> nor question went against any law or the rights that we have as an Australian. Another point mentioned was that his, her comment, no, his comment was were a wake-up call. Ladies and gentlemen, how are we supposed to address the issue of radicalisation and terrorism if you're not open to discussion and fail to recognise all views and perspectives? <coughs> Mala's appearance on the show is a step in the right direction as the Australian public and government are able to hear the truth. Our second speaker talked about the fact that Q&A is a show that encourages diversity <coughs> diversity in the audience, chosen for their perspectives. Q&A is a forum independent of the government that allows different perspectives to be put forward. It is an open discussion and Mallow's first-hand experiences of being in Syria and being subject to anti-terror policies made an appropriate participant of the debate. We applaud the Q&A's effort to give a voice <coughs> to people with different perspectives. Claire also elaborated on the point that the media's subjective spin on Mallow's story leaves out important aspects, such as the fact that his comments were made in response of Trevor's initial comment. Ladies and gentlemen, Zaki Mallow is a part of the Australian community who gave a valuable input to the Q&A discussion on terrorism on the 22nd of June. He had every right to be included in the live studio audience of Q&A.